Okay. Well, multitask if you need to, but I'm going to start talking about gases. So maybe you grab your notes and follow along. Um, before I start, um, just a little bit of a reminder of what this like whole year is about. Okay. Our first unit was on solutions, acids, and bases. And for the most part, I would suggest that we were really talking about a lot of stuff that was like, say, liquids. Okay. Because most stuff was water. And inside water, we were then ionizing or dissociating stuff to make it break apart. So I'd say our first unit is kind of on liquids. Our second unit now is going to be on another state of matter, on gases. And we're going to talk a lot about some math rules behind how gases work. There's going to be a huge math component, so make sure you have a calculator tomorrow. You don't need it today as much, but for sure tomorrow. Um, one of our next units after gases is going to be on bonding. And I like to kind of think of it as, well, now we're talking about how solid stuff sticks together. Why, when I hit this table, did my hand not go through it? Well, that's to do with bonds. Each individual molecule inside that table is really closely stuck together, so my hand cannot physically break that bond. Does that make sense? So in a way, chemistry 20 kind of talks about the different three states of matter, liquids, this unit, gases, and eventually kind of talking about solids. Uh, the fourth unit is on a topic called stoichiometry, which sometimes lab teaches. You guys had lab, or did you have stellar for chemistry? Stellar. Yeah, both. Sometimes lab is a little bit of stoichiometry. Okay, um, it's a very math-based unit, it's working on um, trying to figure out like grams, liters, moles per liter. So very math-based. Okay. Anyways, let's talk about gases. Um, what sort of gases are naturally found around us? Anybody know? Yeah, go ahead, Brad. Though. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are probably two of the most common. Um, we breathe in oxygen because we need it to live, I guess, right? Uh, when you breathe in oxygen, you breathe back out a gas. Carbon dioxide? Yeah. Um, neither of those, though, are the most plentiful in our atmosphere. Anybody know the most plentiful one? nitrogen, yeah. About 77, I think, percent of our atmosphere, 78? Whatever. Close, right? Um, 77, 8 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen, meaning that most of the gas you breathe in is actually not either oxygen or carbon dioxide. Um, a lot of other gases that we might use in our atmosphere, I shouldn't use the word use because they're not usually a good thing, but like you could have methane. Um, there are things called chlorofluorocarbons, known as CFCs. Anybody know what CFCs do, which is really bad for the environment? Go ahead. Burn holes. They like bind with ozone. Yeah. So. Yeah, they bind with ozone and basically destroy our ozone layer. And so CFCs right. have since been outlawed since the 1990s. Um, you guys may have talked about it. It happened in something called the Montreal Protocol. Yes. Yeah. You guys learn about this in science, Ted? Kyoto. Kyoto is another one. Kyoto is trying to ban um, or at least reduce um, carbon dioxide. So anyways, gases are a big part of what's around us. One of the most interesting things, I guess in my mind, about gases is that we don't see them, though. Right? Like, is there gas around us? Sure. I just <gasps> breathed a whole bunch in, <sighs> sent a whole bunch out. But I mean, we don't necessarily, we can't, we can't test gases in the same way we can test solids and liquids. Because here's something solid, I can throw it. No, not a big deal. Here, I'm going to hit gases at you guys. Yeah, right? <laughs> but I mean, what, that's what I was doing in the same way, wasn't I? I was, I was throwing gases towards you. I'm hitting these gas particles. Does that make sense? So gases are a bit weirder to work with. We are actually still going to do labs, though. I have three labs planned for this unit talking about gases. But you know what I mean when I say it's going to be a little bit different? OK, why don't we start in on our notes now? One of the first things I need you guys to know I already kind of talked about the three states of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. Okay. One of the biggest properties that changes these ones is about the motion that they have, the, the, the different bonds they have between them. Okay. Um, here's one of the properties of gases you should know. They have no volume or shape. Okay. Here's a ruler. It has a very defined shape. Well, I guess I could bend it, but like for the most part, a solid thing has a very fixed shape. A liquid can slosh around inside its container. But really, at the end of the day, its volume is more or less its volume, right? Like if this is 100 milliliters of water and I tip this thing upside down, it's still 100 milliliters of water. Does that make sense? 
gases are completely different. Gases will always expand to fill their containers. So gas could have a volume of 3 liters, or if I open up the container, it could have a volume of 12 liters. So gases really don't have these properties. I want to talk about, maybe just write this on the side, three properties of gases I want, or three properties of matter I want you to know. Three types of motion. The first type of motion I want to talk about is called vibrational motion. So when I think of vibrational motion, I think that all matter, whatever it is, is always moving back and forth slightly. Right, like even solid stuff like my computer or the desk. Is it moving back and forth slightly? Sure. You guys ever talk about like how heat is really like how fast particles are moving? You ever heard that before? So like I kind of envision you've got all this solid stuff, like these are particles. They're not just sitting there. They're actually, you know, moving back and forth ever so slightly. If I heat it up more, well they move faster. Does that make sense? What sort of things will have vibrational motion? in terms of like solids, liquids, and gases. Solids will. Solids have the ability to vibrate back and forth. Let's say the solid was ice. What happens if you heat up ice? It melts and it turns into liquid. And let's say you heat up liquid. You can eventually get it to boil. It could turn into a gas. Long story short, all matter has the ability to vibrate back and forth. Solid, liquid, or gas, everything should be able to move. That's one type of motion. Okay, here's the second type of motion. It's called rotational. Well, rotational motion is, how do I want to describe this? Water is the best example. These molecules have the ability to like move wherever they want. Does that make sense? If I put a chunk of solid in here, it would just clang around the sides of my water bottle. But these molecules here, they have the ability to like slip and slide over top of each other. So if I were to have like some molecules sitting here again, this one has the ability to kind of come over here, and this one could go there, and this one could go there, and they could all change where they are. Does that make sense? They can, they can slosh around. Well, who has the ability to do that? Do solids have the ability to do that? No. Liquids do, though. And, and so do gases. Gases have the ability to kind of maneuver themselves around. Does this make sense so far? There's one last type of motion. We call it translational motion. By translational motion, I mean that this particle right here doesn't just have the ability to like interchange itself and move itself within the rest of the particles. This one can just go way over there if it wants. This one can go way over there if it wants. It can go wherever it wants. Like it can literally translate anywhere, which would be like me taking these gas particles and smacking them towards you. The gas particles were here, now they're way over there. And so the only thing that has translational motion is gas. It has the ability to move. Right? This ruler sitting on the desk, is it going anywhere? No. This water in the water bottle, so I take the lid off. Is this water going anywhere? Well, not really. I guess it, I mean, it's sloshing around a little bit. You can see it like, you know, waves in the pool. But is this water really translating somewhere else? No. But there's gas molecules kicking around here. Is this gas molecule that is like, say, right here, is it going to be there in 10 minutes? No. I'll probably have breathed it in and then maybe breathe something back out. Maybe Haley will have breathed it in and out. Maybe it'll be on the other side of the room or maybe it'll have left the room underneath the door, right? Each individual molecule of gas has the ability to move. What was that? Can it go through objects? Well, it can't go through objects necessarily. Um, but I mean, it can go, like, for example, it can go underneath the door or through the vents. Right? There's going to be like a gap in the ceiling. It can get through there. But let's say I seal all this gas inside the container. Well, now it can't leave. Right? But I mean, let's assume we have the lid off. Does that make sense? So three types of motion. Let me go back up to my notes here that I'm kind of skipping through here. Because of this, here are some properties of gases I want you to know. Okay. Gases will always fill their container. Why? Because well, they can move. That makes sense. Gas particles can move wherever they want. They have the ability to you know, transfer from me all the way over to the other side of the room past Oakley. 
or the gas molecule that I breathe in in five years, it might be in China. Does that make sense? Like it's not fixed in one location. Isn't that kind of a crazy thought? Some of the air you're breathing could have come from the other side of the world. Just needed a way to get here. Okay. Um, because of this, gases are very compressible. Do you guys know that word, compressible? You can squish them in, right? When I, when I think of compressed gas, I like to think of like, say, tires, or like a basketball, where you try to take a pump and try to shove as much air inside of them, unless you're the New England Patriots and footballs. Did you follow that? Wait, what, what, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> the New England Patriots and footballs and air inside of it, there's a scandal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's my team, so I can laugh. Okay, do you guys know what diffuse means? Sure. What happens if you were to have a balloon? I'm just going to draw a balloon here. This is a balloon. And let's say you poke a hole in it. What's going to happen to all that gas? Yeah, it's going to escape, right? That's what diffuse means. It has the ability to escape, to, to move, to spread out, basically. Does that make sense? If I have gas trapped in this container right here, and then I open the lid, well, all of the gas will then have the ability to move. Um, I know junior high science students have done this before, where like they spray perfume in a corner maybe, and then like after a minute you can smell it here, and then it keeps moving further back. Have you guys ever done this experiment? Yeah. Lab did that? Yeah. yeah. Right? That's diffusing, the ability for gases to basically spread out and move. Okay, another thing I want to talk about here is just our atmosphere. Okay. Earth is a very unique planet. <laughs> Um, one of the reasons why Earth is so unique is based on its proximity to the sun. I mean, we are at the right temperature. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's perfect. But another reason why Earth is just the perfect planet for life is because of our atmosphere. Our atmosphere traps inside of it all of the gases that we need to live and survive. And not only does it trap... You guys with me? Not only does it trap gas, but it actually traps the right sort of gas. Because it traps that oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. It traps the stuff we need. Okay? For example, if we went to another planet and we discovered the atmosphere was made of argon, helium, and neon gas, it's great that there's an atmosphere there, but it doesn't actually help us because we need the right stuff to breathe and live. Does that make sense? So maybe you've seen stuff like this before where there's like a picture talking about our atmosphere. So like imagine that you're like near Earth. That's called the troposphere, troposphere. And then above the troposphere is the stratosphere. Has ever heard of that term before? No. And then what do we got up here? The mesosphere, thermosphere. Long story short, as we get further and further away from Earth, we have less gas there. Why? Why is there less? Like when, when you go up, say up here, you need to have oxygen <coughs> masks to breathe, right? Like, a, like astronauts need oxygen masks. Why? Why is there not as much oxygen there as there is other places? Yes, good. Gravity. Right? Even though we cannot see gases, they are still mass. They are still matter, and so therefore they're affected by gravity. I feel like you guys are so distracted. I need like full attention, please. Okay. So at the top edge of the atmosphere, the amount of air up there is hardly there. Like if you get up to this top edge of the atmosphere, there's almost no air. There's no oxygen, there's no nitrogen, there's no CO2. You cannot live up here. But because of gravity, down here on the surface of the Earth, there's plenty of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Um, anybody ever been to Denver? Denver, Colorado? Um, Denver, Colorado is fairly high up in altitude. Like it's, at, it's on the top of the Rocky Mountains, basically. And one of the unique things about Denver specifically, and there are other places on Earth too, is that it's so high up that there is less atmosphere there. There's less oxygen. Um, one of the things that I know Denver for is sports teams because there are a lot of sports teams when they go play a game in Denver They do very poorly because their bodies are not used to having such little amount of oxygen in the atmosphere in Denver And they get very tired and very winded fast. Anybody ever heard of this before? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Cool. Okay. There's a there's a player who used to play for the Pittsburgh Steelers named uh, Ryan Clark Football player. I'm a football guy. So I'll tell this story he has, I think it's sickle cell anemia. I could be wrong. But long story short is his body needs to have enough oxygen, just like everybody else's. But his body does something weird with it. So 
he was never allowed to play in Denver. Like, whenever the Pittsburgh Steelers would go play in Denver, he wasn't allowed to play because literally there was not enough oxygen in the atmosphere that high up for his body to be able to play a high endurance sport like football. He would, he, he might actually kill himself. Not because he'd hurt himself playing football or not because of a tackle, but just because his body could not withstand the lack of oxygen. Anyways, I thought that was kind of an interesting side note. Okay. Um, in our gases unit, we need a way to then measure how thick the atmosphere is. Right? Like, if, if there's lots of gas down here where we breathe, and there's less gas in Denver, and there's way less gas, like, way up there in spaceships, that makes sense. we need a way of measuring that. And so the way, way we measure it is called a pressure. You guys have probably heard this before, like, how much pressure there is in, say, an inner tube tire or a basketball or whatever. So the unit of pressure we use is called a Pascal, which is a PA. And the definition of this is it's the amount of force of about one Newton on one square meter. Okay. Um, some of you guys are in my physics class, so you know what Newtons are. But a Newton is a measure of force. Do you guys remember the definition, like in grade 10, of a force? Both of them start with the letter P. A force is a push. You guys ever heard that before? A force is a push or a pull? Okay. Now, when we're talking about gases, gases don't really pull things. But gases can totally push things. Right? Here, I'm going to hit some gas, and now the gas is pushing against the wall. Does that make sense? Really, gas molecules are pinging off of you and me all the time. We don't really feel it all that much. But actually, there, there, there is still gas hitting you all the time. And in southern Alberta, we notice this a lot more when it gets really windy. Because what is wind? Well, really, wind is just when all of the gas particles are moving faster. And they move fast enough that when they hit you, you actually notice it. Does that make sense? Like right now, gas particles are hitting all of you. They're moving around, and they're hitting you. And you don't really notice it. Let's say I turn on the fan. Yeah, you notice it. It feels kind of nice. Gets some nice, cool air circulating through. Well, that's what wind is. Wind is giving a lot of energy to those gas particles, so much so that even though they are very small, a whole bunch of them start hitting you, and you're going to now notice it because, I mean, it's going to cause your car to slow down because you're driving into the wind. Or it means that a kite is able to fly, or a sailboat is able to sail. Does that make sense? So the way we measure this, then, is how much force there is, like a Pascal, is the amount of force there is per area. How much pushing the gas does compared to how much area it's doing the pushing over. So typical units for this are newtons over meters squared. Does that make sense? That being said, to be honest, we don't really use Pascals all that much because it's a really small unit of measurement. Normally, we're going to use kPa. Anybody know what kPa is? Oh, uh, kilograms. Like kilopascals, actually. So do you guys remember what like K stands for, for kilo? Like, what does that mean if you use a number? It, mean, it means it's a thousand pascals. So like one kilopascal is a thousand pascals. Um, it depends on a couple of things here. You may want to highlight this, because I think this is on a test or a quiz somewhere. Pressure on Earth is known as atmospheric pressure. Does that make sense? Like, gas particles right now are hitting you. Right? And the amount at which they're hitting you is called atmospheric pressure. If you go up to Denver, Colorado, the atmospheric pressure should be lower because you're further away from Earth, so gravity affects them less. Okay. Um, the three main things are temperature, height above sea level, so that's why Denver has way less atmospheric pressure, and uh, latitude as well, depending on like whether you're, you're at, like say, the equator versus the North Pole. Uh, here's a picture I found that hopefully can help kind of explain the same concept here. If you're at sea level right here, there should be lots of pressure. Why? Well, there should be lots of molecules of air in here. Why are there so many molecules of air? Gravity. Gravity's pulling them all down. Well, let's say you're up here. Well, yes, there will still be molecules of air, but will there be as many? Well, no because you're further away from the center of the Earth, so gravity affects them less. 
Let's say you're at the top of the mountain. Will there still be air up there? Sure, but even less so. Um, if you were to go hiking, like say K2 or Mount Everest, often you have to bring like oxygen with you, because the higher up you get, you, like there is no oxygen for you to breathe. Yes, because like you, like your bodies are conditioned to needing so much oxygen, whereas whatever they're called Sherpas, yeah, they're probably more used to it. Okay, here's a number you need to write down. At sea level, typically, it's about 101 kilopascals. Fort McLeod is not at sea level. So would you expect the pressure at Fort McLeod to be above this number or below this number? Below. We are, we are above sea level. So the further above sea level you get, the less pressure there will be in the atmosphere. So typically, we should have a pressure that's less than 101 kilopascals. Okay, we have a couple other numbers that I'm going to recommend you write down in your data booklet somewhere because we're going to use them a lot. Okay. Scientists have used this value of 101 kilopascals as a benchmark. Um, it's actually more precise than 101. Point, 101. You guys remember precise? It means there's more decimal places. 101 is actually a really rough value. Sea level has actually been defined as 101.325 kilopascals. But it depends on temperature, because the hotter things are, the faster molecules will move. And the faster molecules move, the more they'll hit things. And the more they hit things, the more force there will be. And the more force there will be, the more pressure there will be. I'm going to say that all one more time. That was a lot. It depends on temperature. Because if you increase temperature, molecules move faster. If molecules move faster, they'll hit things more. If they bounce into things and hit things more, that means there's going to be more force. Well, if there's more force, remember how pressure is force over area? If there's more force, there must be more pressure. Therefore, if you increase the temperature, you also increase the pressure. So pressure is actually dependent on temperature. So we always have to give you a temperature to go with it. Yes? Is that like a pressure cooker? How it's like a big sealed lid on the top? That's, pretty, that's why it's increasing all the pressure. Because what you're really doing is you're not changing the amount of gas in there, but there's more pressure because you're heating it up so much, and that gas is all inside and can't escape. So the gases will not be pinging around faster. So that's why there's so much pressure. Okay. Anyway, long story short, at 101.325, we use the relative temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And scientists have called these conditions STP, standard temperature and pressure. So the standard temperature would be 0 Celsius, and the standard pressure would be 101.325 kilopascals. Years later, scientists discovered that was a really poor decision. Because 0 degrees Celsius is basically like doing every experiment in a freezer or a cold room. Would you guys like to do an experiment next week where I tell you we actually have to go outside to do it in the cold? That would be ridiculous. So after a while of setting these values, kind of realized that was a bad idea. So we have another set of values I also need you to know called SATP, known as standard ambient temperature and pressure. They decided, well, rather than making our standard temperature that we work at zero degrees Celsius, which is ridiculous, let's make it 25, because that's roughly room temperature, roughly, maybe a little bit high, but it'll work. And rather than using this 101.325 kilopascal <coughs> number, if we have to pick a number to be known as a standard number, let's go with 100 because it's not a nice round number. Makes more sense. So if I ever ask you to perform an experiment under STP conditions, it means the pressure must be 101.325 and you're working in the cold. If I ever ask you to work under SATP conditions, it means you want to set the pressure to only 100, but now you have to work in like a nice heated room. Does that work? So that, like, what makes difference? What one? Well, it's like the 101. Oh, yeah. Basically, they're just saying is rather than having to set the pressure at this very specific amount, we're saying, let's just set it to 100. So let's drop the pressure just a little bit. OK. Um, a little bit of history. This is kind of a mismosh of stuff, by the way, this first day. I just teach you all sorts of random bits about the intros to gases. Uh, a name I'd like you guys to know, his name is Torricelli, an Italian scientist. 
And he figured out a way to measure pressure way back in the 1600s. Okay. Uh, basically, it's like a thermometer, only it doesn't measure temperature, it measures pressure. Does anybody know what the name of a tool is that measures pressure? Barometer? Good, it's called a barometer. B-A-R-O-M-E-T-E-R. -E -E barometer. Basically, it's like a thermometer, but it's a thermometer for pressure. Here's what Torricelli did, and I'll, I'll just reference this diagram here. He set up a dish, and inside the dish he used mercury. We don't use mercury anymore, because mercury is poisonous. But Torricelli didn't know this. Uh, one of the reasons he used mercury, though, is it's a very dense liquid, which is useful in this case. And the liquid is so dense that when he set it up, he set up like a tube with like a column, kind of like a thermometer would be, right? Why is this column right here, why does this not just like fall down? Why does gravity not pull this stuff down? Well, it has to do with pressure. Air is hitting everything. Air is hitting this and hitting this and hitting this and hitting this. Well, what else is air hitting? The dish. Normally, if this level were to fall down, what would happen to the level in the dish? The dish would try to go up, but it can't. Why can't the dish go up? Well, because there's air molecules hitting it. Again, can we see these molecules? No, it doesn't mean they're not there, though. And so due to atmospheric pressure, air molecules are bombarding this mercury in the dish, meaning that you actually can't have this thing fall down because this force is keeping it up. Sense. So Baricelli went to sea level. So I, I don't know, apparently he lived close to sea level. And he discovered that his little thermometer, which is actually a barometer, was 760 millimeters from here to here. Like he measured the actual distance. So that's like 76 centimeters. Well, then he took his barometer from sea level and he went to another location. So let's say he went from there and he went to Denver. Obviously he didn't go to Denver, right? What would you expect to happen? to this tube right here. Well, is there more or less pressure in Denver? Less. Way less. It's way up in the atmosphere, less pressure. So if there's less of these arrows, so let me just erase some of them. If there's less of these arrows right here, so is there still pressure? Sure, just not as much. Well, what's gonna happen to the mercury in this tube? It's gonna go down. Will it go all the way down? No, but it'll go down a little bit. And so that's how he made the first instrument to measure pressure. Does that make sense? Um, in terms of that measurement, we've now decided to call 760 millimeters of mercury. We call that like our standard sea level. And so sometimes rather than calling it millimeters, we, we call it another unit called a tor. Tor because we named it after Torricelli. Uh, scientists always seem to name things after themselves. So if any of you go on to be famous scientists, um, you can name something after yourself or after your favorite high school science teacher. Yeah. So one day when you discover like how to measure dark matter, make sure you call the units a shelf, okay? <laughs> so, or name it after yourself, I'll understand. Okay. So anyways, here's the point. As pressure increased, Usually this was an indicator of weather. Have you guys ever seen some of these before? Where like it indicates based on pressure what's going to happen weather-wise? Um, this is what meteorologists do when they're predicting the weather. As pressure increases, it usually means better weather is coming. Whereas the column drops, pressure falling usually means poor weather. You guys ever heard that before or seen that? Like that's like low pressure systems and high pressure systems. Maybe you did that in grade 10. Okay, let's do our actual math for this unit. This is the only thing I need to be able to like do. And it basically has to do with our units. 760 millimeters of mercury is the pressure at sea level. So, sea level. Well, those units are one way of measuring pressure. But another way of measuring pressure is using kilopascals. And this is also the value at sea level. So there's actually two different units for pressure that involve sea level. And there's actually a third. And it's called an ATM. Anyone know what ATM stands for in physics and chem? Not automatic teller machine. <laughs> it stands for an atmosphere. ATM is abbreviation for an atmosphere. And it's another unit of measuring pressure. All three of these things measure pressure. 
One is a very old unit. And it's based on Torricelli's experiment. Okay. This number right here, kilopascals, it's like the SI unit. It's like the official unit. What does SI stand for? Uh, SI stands for System International. It's French, I believe. It's like the official units we use for, for, for stuff. Like Kind of like how kilograms is the official unit of mass. But you could also measure things in pounds or ounces. Um, anyways, the reason why we also have atmospheres is because atmospheres are nice because it's like a nice round number of one. Right? So like if you're at sea level, you have one atmosphere. What would happen if you were in Denver then? Would you have more than an atmosphere or less than an atmosphere? Less. Yeah. What if you went underwater? and you, you went into a pressurized water. sub, you might have more what atmospheres. New Zealand, are they below sea level? Are they below sea level? OK, so they might be there. I mean, the one I might use is uh, Holland is actually underneath sea level because they have those big dikes or dams, whatever you call them there, to like prevent the water from flowing over. So you might actually be over one atmosphere. Long story short, I need you guys to be able to convert between these three types of units. So let me do some examples. Let's say that you go to Mount Everest, and at the top of Mount Everest, you discover that there's 33.7 kilopascals. Does that number make sense, that it's that low? Yeah. Because at sea level, it's just over 100. But you're on top of Mount Everest, so there should not be that much atmospheric pressure. Because there's no gas up there. Why is there no gas up there? Gravity's pulling it all down. You're way up there. Gravity's too far away. So we need to convert this to atmospheres. So I'm a big fan of showing unit conversions. Start with 33.7 kilopascals. Well, we'd like to convert to atmospheres, which means we need to get rid of kilopascals. Do you guys see how like, I set it up like this? The kilopascals will cancel? Yeah. So it's just like unit canceling? Yes, exactly. So not really a formula to it, but I need to know, well, how many atmospheres are in a kilopascal? Well, I'll go back here. How many atmospheres are in a kilopascal? One. one. Exactly one. By the way, these zeros go on for forever. Like, it's exactly one atmosphere in 101.325 kilopascals. So if you want to figure out how many atmospheres this is, take this number. Uh, you could times by one. And then divide by 101.325. 33.7 divided by 101.325. Make sure you're careful on your sig digs, because those still matter. This was measured to the nearest tenth, so it has three sig digs. This guy has like as many sig digs as you want. It's not one sig dig for one, it's like 1.0 till forever. And this guy has six sig digs, so you get three. So my final answer was 0 0.333 atmospheres. That makes sense? Which hopefully makes sense if on sea level, if exactly one atmosphere, way up there at the top of Mount Everest, for Everest, it should be way less than an atmosphere, like a third of an atmosphere. Let's try another one. Let's say that uh, you're going underwater. And underwater, there's a lot of pressure on you, right? Because all that water is forcing you in. Maybe you're in like a pressurized sub. I don't know. But let's say there's 4.2 atmospheres. So there's a lot of pressure. I want you to convert this to the millimeters of mercury number, which was Torricelli's first value. That would be like one over. Well, set up unit canceling. So we have 4.2 atmospheres. We're looking for millimeters of mercury. So I'm going to throw that one up here. And if I don't want atmospheres anymore, I'm going to throw it on the bottom so they can cancel. Now I just need to know the relationship. What's the relationship between millimeters of mercury to atmospheres? This has 760 for every one infinitely. Like that, those zeros go for forever if you want them to. Like an atmosphere has been defined as exactly one on the dot. So 4.2 times 760. So I got 3192. And if you put that as an answer, I would mark it wrong. Why? I only got two sig digs. 
So you're going to have to make it 3.2 times 10 to the 3 millimeters of mercury. Or there's one more thing you could do. Rather than talking about millimeters of mercury, maybe we could talk about centimeters or even just meters of mercury. What was that? Um, well, tor a tor is a millimeter of mercury, though. Like, uh, uh, like one millimeter of mercury is one tor. That doesn't actually help. But rather than doing like times 10 to the 3, if this is a millimeter, like say, say I gave you 3,000 millimeters, that's the same thing as having 3.192 meters. So you could just say that many meters of mercury. That would also work. So then 3.2 meters of mercury. Same like that same number in the like the three point two exponent three yeah. number that would be saying that four meters. That works the same thing, yeah. So you could say three point two times ten to the three tor. That would be the same thing as well. That makes sense. Okay, that's more or less all I've got with one last thing. Um now that I've given you some examples, why don't you guys try some? So for the rest of the class here. Work on these examples, and then when you're done that, can you guys finish up your progress logs? Okay. Um, can I get those in the next few days? Because I need them for report cards. Okay. So that's all I got. Today was a lot of theory and basically one thing of math. You gotta be able to convert units. So I guess one thing I should point out, if you haven't written this down in your data booklet, do it. Because you're gonna want those ratios. You're gonna need them a lot. Because whenever we talk about pressure, any of these three units are, are fair game. So I'll pause the recording here. If you guys have questions, call me over. Otherwise, there's 20 minutes left, so work on whatever you need to.